Mrs. Ibukun Awushika is an African entrepreneur, author, international leader, and global culture shaper. She is the chairman and founder of the Chair Center Group, a leading furniture and security systems provider in Nigeria. She serves as chairman or board member on various corporate and non-profit boards around the world. Over the years, she has received numerous awards locally and internationally. Her most recent recognitions are the 2020 Forbes Woman Africa Chairperson Award and the Beta Gamma Sigma 2020 Business Achievement Awards. Ibuku Awoshika is a woman of many firsts. She was the first female chairperson of Nigeria's premier bank, First Bank, the first Nigerian recipient of the prestigious International Women Entrepreneur Challenge, IWEC Award, and the first African recipient of the International Friendship Award 2019 by the Queen of Spain. She's a seasoned author and shapes culture through her active involvement in media and purposeful entertainment. She featured in the highly rated Netflix original blockbuster movie, Citation, and was the executive producer for God Calling, another exceptional movie which was released on Netflix in 2020. She is happily married to Abiodun Awushika and they are blessed with three wonderful sons. Next Conference 2022, with a resounding applause and a standing ovation, please make welcome Mrs. Ibuku Awushika. Take the stage, Lord. Have your way. I'm just a vessel, nothing more. And when you're done, please take the glory. I'm satisfied just to see you glory. The stage, Lord, have your way. I'm just a vessel, nothing more. And when you're done, please take the glory. I'm sad. Just to see you glorified. Lord, take the stage, Lord. I give you this stage. I give you this moment. I give you this season. And I hand over your people back to you. I'm a yielded vessel. Speak distinctly through my tongue. Fill my mouth with your word and do what only you can do in this place. You know, every heart and every life that is here represented, touch them, touch their future, touch their today, touch their homes, touch their assignments, touch this nation through them, change the world through your children. Let the whole world know that once you show up through your people, things can never be the same. Thank you for the man and the woman of the house, Lord. Thank you for the vision and the assignment. Thank you for their answering of the call. Thank you for your power and your presence in their life. Thank you, Lord, for they will yet do that which they can never dream or imagine. Because you are God and all by yourself, you make it happen. I bless you, Father. I worship and I exalt you. In Jesus' name I have prayed. Let's put our hands together for Jesus. Let's put our hands together for Jesus, not me. For the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. 
for the soon coming king, for Jehovah, the one that was, that is, and that will forever be. For my redeemer, my strength, my shield, my hope. For the reason I live, I move, and I have my baby. The God who has no respect for where you were born, who has no respect for your beginning, who has no respect for your limitations, the God that is consistent in every situation, the one that is more than able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can ever dream or imagine according to his power that dwells on the inside of you. He is the one that we have come to his presence. I've never known him to fail. And he's never late. You might not understand his timing. But God is always on time. Please be seated. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you very much for inviting me. I know we had a long, windy journey trying to get to this moment but sometimes it's like that because my feet they're very light on the ground as my people say I clock a lot of kilometers on my shoes so I guess if I had a meter there it would have gone bust so sometimes it's hard to find me not because because you came through a source that is there to me and people matter in my life you know, so I always consider relationships. So I do things sometimes simply because the person who has asked me is someone that means something to me. And I want to make them know that it means something. So I go the extra mile in order to do this. But more than that is that I have an assignment and a commitment to build the next generation for Christ. And I take my assignments seriously, like anything else in my life. And, you know, yesterday I was in a lunch meeting with Pastor Godman and the VP for International for Global Leadership Network uh, from GLS. And he was in Nigeria and the executive in charge of Africa. And I remember one thing I said to him is this, to build our nation and to build the world for Christ there's a need to build an army of young enabled empowered people who understand leadership and the use of power because the church has positioning has power but mostly the church doesn't understand power and therefore the church doesn't know how to play power in the place of his opportunity. And when you think about how many people are in church in a nation like Nigeria, and you get to a place where you cannot see the visibility of the power of the church in the process of the governance of the country, it's simply because we've, ne we've never learned what it means and how to position for it and how to build the blocks that makes the church relevant within the system. And to actually make things different, to change the nation, you need a critical mass of right thinking, empowered, enabled, value-driven young people who learn early enough to move with certain principles and values and a heart that fears God every day, wherever they are positioned, in such a way that there's a place where we have the critical mass and the collective will that is bound to the things of God and the ways of God in such a way that it is impossible to make any decision in a country that does not submit to that which is God's will. It's not a short-term project. It's a long-term project. But when I look at a place like this today, I have hope. 
When I look at young, passionate pastors, thinking right and moving right, I have hope. When I see the number of you who are committed to come out in the rains on a Saturday morning, which meant that you didn't go partying last night. That's why you could wake up early to get here. It means that we have the 7,000 in the land. Listen to me. But the 7,000 in silos is powerless. It is the connectivity of the 7,000 together that creates the power. Because individually, they will stand alone. Have pockets of the power, but without connecting to the power in each of the other. The superpower of the 7,000 cannot manifest. And that's why you need to have an understanding of what is the actual goal what is the vision? What do we as a people even want for our country? How do we want it? What is our individual role? How do we play our role? Even as children of God who are citizens of a nation. Because the Bible says that salt is what? It sweetens. If you cook soup without salt, is bland but salt adds flavor to it it says we are the light of the world which means in the place of darkness once we appear there must be light in the land and we can get excited about that but it's useless except we manifest it if indeed our lights are like candle individually locked up in different rooms and we don't bring all the lights together to create the super light that lights up the darkness of the space. We cannot achieve the transformation that we need. As collective as the assignment is, yet it is individual. Because it requires every single individual one taking responsibility for their part of the vision. When you take responsibility for your part, you will be accountable for it. You will move with a knowing, with an understanding. You will think about consequences of your actions. You will think about the losses that your actions can cause. Yet, you must be able to understand the gains that your actions will bring. And therefore, you will not act anyhow. You will act intentionally and deliberately seeking to create a consensus of good for a nation that God has given so much to, including you. But whose fortunes and possibilities are undermined by our disengagement of the 7,000. Well, that's not what you asked me to speak about today. But I'm going to try to stick to the agenda. Kings of enterprise, believers in the boardroom. But guess what? There's not a single company in the world that will be rated above the rating of the sovereign. That is the truth. It's the principle of rating companies. You can, no matter how brilliant you are, if you are the most successful company in Nigeria, your rating cannot be above the rating of the nation. It is a rule. So if we're talking about kings of enterprise, believers in the boardroom, before you can build your successful companies and build the greatest boardrooms where decisions are made or partake in it or participate in it, you must first build the nation because that will become your limiting factor. That is your truth. Because I need you to understand that it is critical. It's not just about us. It's about us fulfilling the assignment for which we, you and I, were made citizens of this country of, and not of another. Because God doesn't make mistakes. 
God is the God of purpose and God of assignment. He has a reason. He deliberately and intentionally assigned specifics to different countries, to different homes, to different families. Some of you despise the families that you come from. How? Because your first confession in saying, I wish this person was my father. I wish this, I was never born by this man or this woman. Is to say, God, you failed. God, you made a mistake. God, you were asleep when you sent me in one direction. God, there's nothing good in this for me. But the Bible says all things work together for what? For my good. That the thoughts of God towards me, they are thoughts of good and not of evil. To bring me to what? An expected end. Therefore, there is an expected end in my story. There's an expected end in my journey. There's an expected end in my beginning. The beginning is not the story. Anybody can start anywhere. It's about how you finish. So don't get distracted by your disadvantages at the beginning. I used to be a serious athlete. They used to call me the rabbit. I used to run as fast. I ran throughout for, I went to Methodist Girls High School, Lagos. Was on the relay team from Form 2. Ran throughout, went to university, was still part of the uh, athletic team for University of Ife. So, oh, there are a lot of great Ife people. So I understand you can have a false start at the beginning of a race. If you watch all these Olympics races, sometimes the guy with the false start is still the guy who breasts the tape. So it's not about where you start from. Some people have a quick start and then they tire out. They don't finish well. It plays back into life. So somebody by 30 is already writing millions of Naira checks. So? And you're wondering, how am I still where I am? Who wrote the story? You? Or Jehovah, who knows the plan? A time and a season. Different for each. But what is your responsibility? To trust the storyteller. To trust the one who wrote the story. And understand that at the right point in your story, your victory is there. And that the most important thing to God is how you finish. And for everyone's story, he wrote it to end well. Now, your interpretation of what it means to end well might be different from God's. Just know that. Somebody dies at 30, you think he's a disaster. Jesus died at 33. And you're still here because of Jesus. How many thousands of years after? Somebody lived till 110 in Akoko village. Do you know his name? You probably don't. So he tells you it's not in the numbers. It's in the purpose and the assignment of God. And so you want to be kings of enterprise? For what reason? I am about the purpose. I don't care what you want to become because you can be anything that God has called you to be. There are no limitations on what you can be as long as it is what God has called you to be. If you run the race of another, you're a foolish man. So if you look at someone and say, oh, I want to be the best of what he is, that's fine as long as that's where you've been called to. Personally, I do not play to my weakness. I only play to my strength. If I find something that somebody can do better than me, I'm gone. It means I will cede it to that person and I'll spend the time that has been released from that on the things that I am good at so I can be better and best at it. It's a more efficient use of my time. And at the end of the day, God is not going to ask me who cooked the food in your house. What is the real question? Did I feed my family as I was required to as the mother of the house? Yes. So as long as the food got delivered, we had. I met my obligations. 
I only use that as an example to tell you how to maximize the use of your time more for the goal than for the works. Remember Mary and Martha. It's about learning how to make the right choices. So, we want to build the business. Great, we want to build the best career in the world. You should. You should never be afraid to sit at the highest table. I am not, and I'm sure you know that. There's no table that is too big for me. Why? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So, I am not afraid of any table. Bring it on is my attitude. I might not be 100% prepared to somebody else as are today. But the Bible said, let the weak say what? And I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Once I feel a leading and a drawing to that assignment and the Lord opens the door, I do not allow my fear or my undermining of myself to take away from a door that God has opened for him to perform through me in the space. So, kings of enterprise, show me a man that is diligent in his ways. He will stand before kings and not mere men. But it starts with the vision. What is the vision? What business are you in? What career are you in? Have you Ask the Lord whether to turn to the left or to turn to the right, that you may walk in it. Are you guided and led by the Spirit of God as are the sons of God? Have you made a choice of where to build based on your talent, your giftings, your opportunities, and the leading of God? Because sometimes your giftings and your talent might look like a perfect fit for one, but yet... It was designed to be for another. And only God can lead you there. So everything that seems right is not always right. And you cannot be a king in the place where the kingmaker has not assigned you. You know, when I was in school, I first thought I wanted to be a doctor. I'm sure some of you have heard this my story before. Then I found out real dead bodies are a real thing in medical school. I had a nice good idea not to be a doctor. And abandoned that because I just didn't think I could deal with it. I then decided I wanted to be an architect. I was good in sciences, good in arts. But anyway, I ended up in university to study chemistry. Before the end of my first year, I realized how much I hated chemistry. As much as I could pass it well in secondary school, I hated it in Ife. So I then decided that, you know what? Everybody tells me that I'll make a great lawyer. Simply because I could debate very well. I was debating for Methodist Girls High School, won the Lagos State Best Speakers Contest and all of those things. I can win an argument. So I decided, okay, I'm going to be a lawyer. I used to go and sit outside the office of the Dean of Law in Ife for a long time, waiting to see him, to ask to transfer from chemistry to law. Finally, his secretary told him, there's this girl you must see, because she's been sitting outside your office for a while. She finally allowed me in to see him. And he then asked, what do you want, young lady? I hear you've been sitting outside my office. I said, yes, sir. What can I do for you? I'd like to transfer to law. I said, eh, hey, that's why you've been coming to sit here. I said, yes, sir. Courage I don't lack. The man looked at me, laughed, and said, you know what? I like your guts. If I only take one person from another faculty next session, it'll be you. But however, make sure you pass very well. Well, therein lies my problem. Pass very well, what would happen? Chemistry will not release me. Who went to Ife here? <laughs> Fail, what will happen? Law will not accept me. Catch 99. So I soon realized that I was stuck in my agenda. 
But I resolved it myself because before the end of the session, I'd actually changed my mind about wanting to become a lawyer. The fickleness of our thoughts. At one point, you will be so certain you thought you knew, which is why you need God. I then decided I would like to be a chartered accountant so I can go and work in a bank. So I started taking all the free electives that were available and that I had space in my workload to take in faculty of uh, administration and accounting from part two to my part four. I took all the electives. I did better in their courses than mine. Anyhow, I finished and planned my youth call, which I was assigned to Kano to serve in an accounting firm. Of course, NYC did not first send me to one. Chemistry, they sent me to go and teach in a, a school. I solved that problem, it was easy. I just wore a dress off my shoulder. I went there and they rejected me. <laughs> that was the plan anyway. So once they rejected me, thank you. Sometimes when people think that they're doing you evil, they're doing you good. They're serving your purpose. So I went back to NYC, sat outside their room for three days. You know, I'd had a good practice. Until they asked, what do you want? I said, I want to go and serve in Akintola Williams and Co. I have the letter. To get rid of me, they took the letter from me and sent me there. So now you would think my perfect plan was fully executed. Well, I got there. So be careful what you think you know and what you think you want. So I got there. My dream supposedly was fulfilled. But I soon discovered how much I hated the auditing. Yeah. It was boring for me. All dusty files from one company to the other. You couldn't use your brain. They already had all these uh, Tushros international procedures. You were just meant to follow somebody else's brain work. I had a brain for a reason, or I have one for a reason. I'm a super restless human being. It was a misfit. But whatever your hand finds to do, do it well. That's one of my mantras. So I stayed with it, did the best that I could within the year. Couldn't wait to finish. But because I did my job, they offered me full employment, think they were doing me good. Sometimes the blessings that seem to come are not of God. So it's not every blessing that is yours. So you must be sensitive in the spirit because some blessings will entrap you on your way to destination. But you must be discerning enough as you walk with the Lord to find the true place where the Lord has called you to. So I said to them, thank you, but no thank you. I left Kano and came back to Lagos with no plans. I didn't have a job waiting for me, but I knew that I wanted to work anyway. Look, I was a very rich copper because I used to do everything and anything. TV, commercials, I used to do voiceover on TV. You know, I was an athlete, so I used to do aer run aerobics classes for people that wanted one-on-one -on -one service. So I was making money. I was presenting a program on CTV, which is Kano's local TV station. I was getting paid. So I've always been enterprising. So I came back, and the first job I could get one week after my youth call was in a furniture company. I took the job to kill time whilst waiting for my bank job. Be careful of your own agenda. Do not let your personal agenda get in the way of God's agenda for you. So you need to be discerning and be submitted in your spirit so that when God speaks, you will hear him. To be the king of an enterprise or the king of a sector of an industry, you have to be God-led. This is the truth. Many things look like it. Many spaces seem attractive. 
some have succeeded in some spaces and therefore it sounds like a good idea but every good idea for somebody else is not necessarily the best idea for you and to be king you must be in your own space your assigned location that is what you must learn to seek and God is the one who leads you into it sometimes with bus stops on the way and therefore you would have some transit points like me going to the Akintola Williams and Co as much as I found out I hated it I learned a lot there that served me in the future of my life on any board I sit till today because of that experience I'm most likely to be assigned to an audit committee why because it's on my CV that I did that so as far as they're concerned I understand financial records and I will be great in audit committee of any board so you have to understand certain parts of your life you might not love them you might not be excited by them but there is value in every bus stop of your life and you must learn to celebrate and embrace them which is why no matter what your hand finds to do do it well do it well remembering that wherever you are you are an ambassador of Christ in that space what you do there will reflect Christ or not what you do there you are representing Christ and at the end of the day you must leave a good legacy of Christ as an ambassador of him where you are that is really important anyhow I did that and the first job I could find one week after youth call was in a furniture company I wanted to kill time in other to find my bank job I only lasted three and a half months in that job but it was enough to show me what I did not like about the business it was owned by some Lebanese people I didn't like their value systems but I found that I loved the turning around of space and the creativity involved in the industry remember I'd wanted to study architecture all of that came alive and I thought I can do what they do and do it right and do it with the right value system I was 25 going on 26 I left and went to start my own manufacturing company now it's 34 years since I've been building a manufacturing group in furniture and security systems accident of faith you would call it but God's ordained purpose and plan now the question to ask is was that the ultimate assignment for my life do you think so no it was a proving point it was a place of learning it was a place to test the principles it was a place to learn patience it was a place to show that you can build sustainably it was a place to show that you could be resilient it was a place to show that I could stay with it and prove that within an industry first a girl could survive two a girl could build forward and you could build through many economic cycles of Nigeria to continue to survive despite the challenges over time and to show that God is in the heart of our business now everything else that came in my life came from the exercise and the journey of building that company of building that group so by the time the major corporates started looking for me for roles on their board and all of that it was because of the evidence of the place of that company even with challenges that came with it so what am I saying to you as long as you follow God and you follow him in his ways why is that important we're in a market and a world that has his own explanation and definition of how to do things but you are a child of God that is not a negotiable part of it and the economic space is not outside of the control or, and the influence of God so you cannot become a king 
a king outside of Christ if you're a child of God. And therefore, if you want to build as a king and rule in the boardroom sustainably for the longest time, you have to build in his name. And building in his name is building according to the pattern of the word. You know, when I was starting, I had two things. And I wasn't a Christian when I started. I was just a young, idealistic young woman who had been brought up as a Muslim girl. But I had two things. I didn't want to sleep with a man to get a job. And I didn't want to pay a bribe to get a job or to do anything in the business. About a year into my business, I met the Lord and became a Christian. God knew I would need him and the power in his word to be able to fulfill that which I desired in my heart as he had inspired. And it's in anchoring my dream to the source that I found the wisdom and the grace to be able to build over time and build sustainably despite every challenge. So, your values as a king, if you want to reign, you know they say a tiny hole can sink a ship. The most tasking part of you ruling in any space, whether in the boardroom or in your career or in your business space, is that you must be consistent for all times. And what will keep you consistent? The word of God. Following the ways of God. Are you a man whose word can be trusted? Are you a man whose work can be trusted? I have discovered that the Bible has a scripture for every challenge you could ever encounter in business. That's why I wrote the book, Business is Way. If you find my book, Business is Way, you will find scriptures for everything. Plus, there's far more than that available. You know, there was a stage where I encountered the ministry of a guy, an American guy called Larry Bucket. And his business, his entire ministry is about building Christian businesses according to the word. It was fascinating to realize how much investment had been made in ensuring that we could build and build according to pattern and build sustainably and build knowing that God is the partner in your business. Have you ever read a book? There's a book by R.G. Letone, Movers of Men and Mountain. Who's found it before? Go and look for it. If you want to build and be a king, you must build according to God's pattern. Find the book, Movers of Men and Mountain, R.G. Letone. Most of the earth-moving machines that you see for road construction and all that were designed by this guy. But he was a Christian man. He was a man who prayed at night when, once he encountered a problem in road construction. He would pray and he would go to bed with a notepad and a pen by his bedside. And he would ask the Lord to show him the solution of how to solve the problem that he encountered. So that he would not build the road at a loss. Because he had a lot of rocks and all of that to destroy. And flaring that will increase his cost substantially. In the middle of the night, the Lord will come to him and give him a vision of what he needed. He would wake up and draw whatever it is the Lord ministered to him in the night. He would go back to sleep. In the morning, he would think that he had a dream, but he found his notepad with what he had sketched. He had knowledge in metal works. He would then go ahead and try to build the machine. And in building that machine, he will solve a problem. Some of the earth moving machines, you see all these caterpillar kind of things. Go and read the book. Find out how those solutions. The great businessmen of old were men and women who were linked to God at the heap. They were inseparable with God. They were men and women whose ways and decisions were from God. Who allowed God to truly lead them in the ways that they go. Sometimes you will look like a madman to people. Why? Because the ways of God are not the same as the ways of men. But once you find those words and you make the commitment, you would find that 
in doing the things that you do every day, you would be exceptional and not ordinary. That you will build and build in a way that will separate you from the crowd. That the Lord will prepare you ahead of time for the moments and the seasons of your life. He will tell you things that will keep you ahead of the game. In 2004 January, I was in business school in Spain, but I'd come home and I was studying when the network news was going on. So at a point, I got a call. It was from Tayo Adere Okmo of Blessed Memory, one of the founders of Guarantee Trust Bank. And he called me to say, where are you? I said, I'm at home. Okay, did you listen to the news? I said, no, I'm studying, Brataya. He said, okay, the government just banned everything furniture. I said, eh, hey. he said, eh, hey. that's all you see. I said, it is well. He said, how can it be well? I just told you that effectively by policy, they just threw your business into trouble. I said, Brataya, it is well. I got away from him. I went to my husband and told him what he said. And my husband said, okay, let's wait for the recap. So we waited for the recap of the news. And after we listened to that, so my husband asked me, so what are you going to do now? I said, oh, don't worry. The Lord will guide me. So I went away and I went to pray. The next morning I woke up and I prayed. I went to my office and I told all my workers, stay calm. God is in control. And then I remember that three years before, the Lord asked me one day, what will happen if what just happened happened? Three years. And I remember that I thought about it and I wrote a plan. But I didn't execute it, which was my foolishness. Because if I had executed it, I would have been the only one that was prepared and ready for that moment. But you know, God is a merciful God. So I didn't panic. I knew in my heart, this situation had God in the middle of it. So I said, I said, God, I know you. I know I am exactly where you want me to be. But I also know that you're not the God that places my feet upon the rock and kicks the rock from under it. That that's not your nature. So if you allowed this now, and the Bible says that all things work together for my good, it means there is good in this situation for me. What I need, Lord, is that you will keep me calm and you will grant me the wisdom and the understanding for this season and lead me through. There were certain opportunities in what the government announced. They had a 90-day window. And in the 90 days, it would take 90 days before the law would become effective. I was in the middle of God knows how many projects then. So I spent that next day going to my different key clients that we were in the middle of certain key projects and said to them, I have 90 days. I promise you I can deliver everything you need for the next 24 months of your business. But it means you need to do future orders now and you need to commit resources to me in the next 24 hours. Favor went ahead of me. Every one of my key clients said yes. Why? Trust. So in building your business to be king of your space, build trust. Ensure that your word is your bond. That people can trust what you say. That people know that when you promise to deliver, you will deliver. That people know that you're a man and a woman of integrity. That your character will speak for you no matter where you are. That grounds will shift when it concerns you. So I got superbly funded within 48 hours by these key clients of mine. I got on the plane and I was traveling for weeks. First, I had to go to five countries because I was producing components out of five countries. So I went in everywhere, had conversations, restructured, reorganized, ordered for the projects and future stock to take my business through the season. I didn't have to look for money. Don't forget, I was funded ahead by clients. So it was their payment plus my profits that I was funded with. So I had 
capital to do what I had to do. And in the midst of that, going to the plan that the Lord had gotten me to prepare, I looked through my industry and decided the weakest point that would be most difficult to address. And decided in the furniture value chain, office seating will be difficult. Tables, you can knock something together and create a table. But technical seating, you can't if you don't have the right materials. So I went to a company in France that was already producing for us for about 10 years and went to them and said, the law has changed in my country. I no longer can just take what you produce for me. I have to produce in my country. And they were like, ah. You know, we sell all over the world. They're in top 10 in the world, but it's Africa where they're going to go and produce. They only produce in France and Spain around their circle, but they sell all over the world. I said, well, you either come with me or I will do it without you, but I will do it anyway and you will lose my market. And I was in their top 10 dealership in the world. So they thought about it and said they'll come back to me, but I only had one confidence, Jehovah. That I didn't go there alone. I went with God. And that God is the one that can make a man against his will to do God's will. And that he was able to pull down every stronghold and level every mountain. Fill every valley. And make everything work together for my good. I kept reminding myself, this was working for my good. I left. Went to another place. Two weeks after. The French company called me and said, okay, you know what? We'll work with you to set up in Nigeria, but we'll only do 5% investment and we'll give you all technical support. I took it. Why? If God opens a window, you can be sure there's a major door is about to open. The window was just the first step. So I had to have faith. So in building to rule, you must see what nobody else can see. You must be able to move ahead of the time and the season. You must not judge your vision by the now. You must judge it by the God that is your God. You must be able to scale and see the size and scope of what God can do. But you must also be satisfied with the little beginnings. Because the Bible says, do not despise the days of humble beginnings. Because sometimes people miss it because they're not patient or humble enough. To start small and to grow big. They want to be big from day one and they mess it up because of that. So there is wisdom in following the ways of God. Anyhow, six months after, the same company came back to me and said, as we progress, we're building the plan that their board had now approved that they should make a 21% investment in the company and they'll give us every support Guarantee Trust decided that in seeing all of this, because we supplied them furniture from day one that they started, they knew who these partners were, they knew the product, and they felt they're coming with you. We said yes. They said, okay, we will make an investment, and we will buy in 32% of the company. And I had two individuals who came in at 5%. I took 37%, and that company was settled. And that became the first international office seating manufacturing plant in sub-Sahara Africa. What am I saying to you? Anything and everything that God inspires in your heart, not a single one of it can be too big for you. It doesn't matter what hurdles you see because everything will bow at the feet of Jesus. The Bible says at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is, is Lord. Commit your ways to him. And I think you'll be shocked. In my experience of 34 years of being in business, I have seen God move through mountains. And then, you know, I'm still doing my own thing. Building the businesses that the Lord had given me the grace to. But doing it the way I felt would honor him. And that process of honoring God is what took me to the boardroom. Because all of a sudden, Nigeria had a change of scenario. Corporate governance became a thing that was emerging. Every company was then seeking for people with certain value system to come and serve on their board. I didn't have one share in First Bank when I went to join the board of First Bank. Before then, 
A year before that, I had been invited to join the board of Cadbury. And Cadbury was simply about the value system. So the things that God wants you to do according to the word that the world will tell you will slow you down and make your businesses impossible to prosper. That compromise is the order of the day. They lie. Why? It might be slower to men. But remember, God has a time and a season. Anything you do outside of God's season will set you up for trouble eventually. Because I know many people that we started in furniture together will no longer exist. And I know the time and season that some disappeared and it was based on values. There was a time the government got up in this country and decided that they were shutting down the Nigerian ports. Any shipment that was in Nigeria port was locked in, no matter who had it. You had to go to the port and declare the goods in your container. Now, we had a good problem. What was our good problem? Because of those two things I told you that I'd made up my mind we would do from the beginning, never pay a bribe, never sleep with a man. It meant we always paid the correct duty, painfully so. Painfully so. Why? Because at a point, duty on anything furniture in Nigeria was 100%. It's true. Go and check. And we paid. So it looked like madness. Even my staff sometimes will come to me, Madam, are we going to make money when you make us do these things? But I then went back to God and said, you are the reason I'm in this position. You are the reason I will not do some things. Therefore, you have to honor me and honor your word. You will make me many times more prosperous than my peers. My cost is higher because I will do the right thing. But you know what you are going to do for me? You will show me how I am more efficient and you will give me the turnover that they can only dream of. So that my small margin multiplied by my volume sales will translate to a higher profit than my peers. That's what God did. First, he led me to places where I could cut my cost of production and manufacturing from places around the world. And therefore, in volume and waste, that's how I learned CKD, ahead of the market. Found OEM manufacturers for components and parts for a factory ahead of the market. And therefore, our goods will come in in large volume because you can only do OEM manufacturing in volume. They have container specifics. You want to produce just one component of a chair, sometimes you need to order so many thousands of something. So you have to look for the volume to sell it. But in doing that, with correct duties, our margins were small, but where did we now gain? Nigerians do not plan. They will build a 10-story building, and two weeks to the opening, they will remember the furniture. And then they will get out, and they'll be searching to buy furniture everywhere they can get it. Guess who wins? Whoever has the capacity to deliver in that short window is the one that gets the order, whether your product is the best or not. That is what we found out. That now became our advantage because in doing OEM manufacturing and carrying components in volume with the capacity to combine together to create any product at speed, we could take on projects like this and take projects off people's hand because we could respond. And this was a situation that arose because we were trying to avoid corruption. What am I saying to you? Don't be boxed by the ways of the world if you want to rule and be a king. There are creative God-ordained solutions and inspired routes that the Lord will give you that he will guide you into no matter what your industry is. You need to decide what is your vision? What are the values that drive it? Who are you accountable to? Who do you want to please? Do you want to serve God or do you want to serve mama? Because at the end of the day, it's not about money. God has more than enough to give you. The cattle on a thousand hills, who owns it? The silver and the gold, they belong to your father. But you must first desire and conclude that what you want to do, you want to do for God in his way, according to his will, 
and be willing to make the necessary sacrifice along the way. If you're ready to die for God, you won't have to die. That's what I found. But you must first be willing to die for him. And God must know that you're ready to die for him. And once he knows you're ready to die for him, you will be shocked how he will show up and the doors that he will open. You know, the day I was appointed to the board of First Bank, my younger sister, she came to me and said, you know, sis, I used to think that Allah shed you need. No, no, if you don't understand, you're right. It means that you are overdue. That's why do you always make things so difficult for yourself with all these principles and values that you hold on to? That everything, if it's not this way, you're not going to do it. I always thought, ah, life can be easier. Your peers are doing this and they're making money. She said, but, you know, I sat down today and I realized that, ah, some of those people I thought were making money have come and they've gone. Some are there, but all they can think of is that they've made some money. But you have consistently continued to grow. You consistently continue to make the money as long as you were building. But on top of that, the honor and the favor that the Lord has shown you, money cannot buy. Listen to me. When you choose to walk with God in building in the marketplace, it will be tough. There will be days you will ask yourself, are you crazy? And I'm not. I haven't been crazy in 34 years. But I found it profitable to follow him. I fight the battles, yes. Because you have to. You know, the devil will never yield ground to you easy. But you must know why. What you stand for, what you're fighting for. And even in the days when it seemed like you lost a battle. Don't ever be deceived. God never loses a battle. It might not be time yet. And you must know him and trust him enough. David seemed like he had lost at Ziglag. Everything was taken from him. He was a broken man. But he wasn't stupid to walk away from God. He walked to God. And in walking to God, God told him what to do. He not only recovered all, he recovered more. So, I could just have taught you about business today, but I would have done you a disservice. Because every skill of business I could teach you cannot stand without God. It cannot stand without your absolute understanding that you work for God. That you are a treasurer in the house of God. If you want to be a king and a ruler in the marketplace and in the boardroom. I am not a businessman that is a, a businesswoman that is a Christian. I'm a Christian assigned to business. They are two different things. Business is my pulpit. I can preach. I'm a pastor. But my real pulpit of assignment is in the marketplace. Why? I meet many across the world. In boardrooms local, in boardrooms international. In sessions, in planets, and in continents. Who will never come to church? But I am their church. My life, my testimony, my challenges my victories, how I stand through it, how I do not give up on my God, and how I stand in righteousness through the toughest moments is the sermon they will ever see. And at the end of it, that sermon must speak. Let me end this before we, we go into Q&A with a story. I like to share about my life. People ask me, why do you share so much of your life? You make yourself so vulnerable. Of what use is it? Dead people don't use testimonies. In heaven, there is no use for the testimonies of my life. I live a life, God permits a life to create a bank of experiences for his glory, for nothing else. So I've not killed anybody or stolen anybody's money. I have no secret, so I don't hide. You know, after all the first bank drama, I was in the process. In fact, there were two scenarios. One, I was being processed to serve on the board of a company that would be listed on the New York Stock Exchange, and they were in the process. It was not a Nigerian company, it was an American company, and they were in that process, when all the first bank drama happened. And because when evil is at work, they use everything, 
and they will distort and they will lie and they will do all that they like. But we're also a country who doesn't know how to trust because we've had a lot of leadership failure from our people. We don't trust people. It's important that we must learn to be discerning even if we cannot know all the details. You have to be discerning. When things happen, go back and ask the Lord to reveal the truth to you in this situation. Because sometimes it's not expedient to speak at a time and a season. Because wisdom, leadership has responsibilities. And sometimes you must hold back because that is the wisdom for that moment. So we found ourselves in that situation. But I knew that God is in control of everything, no matter what I see. So I had two different things. One of the biggest law firms in the world who were representing this company, who had to sign off for their security and exchange commission, then had to call me and have a meeting. So I, there I was on a virtual one hour meeting with this firm, five lawyers, some with gray hair and everything, wanting to understand what really happened in Nigeria. The truth is the easiest and the simplest thing always to say. So we had this meeting for about an hour, explained all the facts as I knew it, and left them to make their own judgment. And at the end of the day, you know, they said to me, you know what, we trust you, we love you, we respect you. We've done our homework before we had this meeting with you, but we had to have it because we're required to sign off and all of that. And we'd like you to know that we're going to sign off and your, appoint your appointment or your nomination still stands. So that went through because the truth will always be the truth. So when I say to you, live your life with a value system that cannot be challenged. Build a trail of righteousness in the things you do every day because the time of troubles will come. And if you're building as a king and you want to build a platform where God will be celebrated at the highest level, the devil will challenge you. But you prepare for him, not in the moment of the challenge. You prepare for him in your every day. In what you do every day. In how you do it every day. In your honor and your integrity and your truth every day. In your character every day. Why? Because every day you're experiencing people. People are experiencing you. They test you. They see you. They deal with you. They have a sense of who you are. When it matters, all those people will speak for you or they will speak against you. So be intentional and deliberate about what you do, realizing that you represent God. Second one. So this global organization that then appointed me to serve as part of something at the highest global level called me one day. The CEO of the organization in charge of all that process called me and said, you know, we're doing all of this work on all the members that would serve on this board and you know, we have this red flag and we have to deal with it. He said, yes. So ask me this question, this question, I explain. Different from whatever it is that the guys who were driving media or using media to achieve their own goal were doing. So he said, I hope you understand that we're going to do our work. I said, go to the ends of the earth and come back. I allow you. And so they did. Three months of work across the world. And they came back. I think this was October. By December, they had their board meeting and approved for me to serve in my capacity as chair of the board that I serve on at that, for that global level. You know, who then brought it home for me? My youngest son, he looked at me. One day we were discussing this matter and he said, mom, you know, I know you were upset. I know you were angry, but you know that this thing really actually worked in your favor. I said, eh. He said, look, those people think they had an idea of you, your value system, who you are. But now, they really, really know you. I said, eh. She said, yes, because they've had to turn everything around, everywhere around the world to check you out. And when they finished, they concluded you are who you are. And therefore, you could go on. Now, no matter where, they need to be involved or speak. They know that they can disregard and they can move. That is to your advantage and not against you. So listen to me. You want to be a king and a ruler in the marketplace for the Lord? You prepare for the war, but you prepare for the victory. But you prepare for the war every day. 
Because your preparation in the word, your preparation in your diligence, your preparation in your excellence, your preparation in your values, your preparation in what you do every single day as you follow God is what keeps you steps ahead of the competition at every point in time. The Lord will help you. He will guide you. He will lead you. He will teach you. He will open your eyes to see. You will not be deceived, nor will you be confused. You will hear a voice telling you which way to go, whether to turn to the left or to turn to the right, that you may walk in it. And there is nothing that is difficult for you to do. No matter how big it seems, a bite at a time will bring an elephant down to bones. Just remember that. And nothing is impossible with God. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you. We are a good party. What a session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. I sit down too much in my life. So I like it when I get to stand. Okay. So you may be seated. Let's Please. just take a few questions. Yeah. Wow. Let me say this here before I start to ask questions. I truly believe that everyone needs to go back on YouTube to listen to this message. Um, the new church, the new church on YouTube, so you can go on YouTube. It, it, she said too many things. <laughs> it's too much. Okay, Ma, the first question I want to ask you. Um, and I will start from the last would be everyone says that Nigeria is the giant of Africa economically what are your thoughts as regards that and what do you think this generation of young believers should do because like you said it sometimes seems as though the other side is winning in that sense and what do you think we should do or what are the things you've observed um, is it laziness is it, I mean, what are the things you've observed um, because one of the things I heard you say and the underlying tone of what she was saying you can hear a lot of courage, um, courage strength um, resilience grit um, what are the things you would advise this generation um, to do, to position stronger as the giant of Africa. Okay. The giant of Africa is the cumulative naming of Nigeria. But in reality, Nigeria in itself is a landmass. What is really called Nigeria is its people. And so the real greatness of a country is in the individual greatness of his people. So your responsibility for the greatness of Nigeria to emerge is in you fully manifesting all of who you are to the highest level that you have been given and called of God. And how do you do that? First is in being diligent and empowering yourself. If you need an education for what your interest is, Seek it. Find it. Oh, I'd like to go to Oxford. I can't afford it now. You can succeed in life without Oxford at this point. There's a point at which Oxford will look for you. If you succeed right. There's a point at which you can go to Oxford. I went to a Nigerian university. I went to a Nigerian secondary school. But when I went to international schools, I paid for it myself. My father didn't have to do that. But I was at the point where I could then do that. Now, I'm the only African and Nigerian on the board of Yese Business School that I went to. And I've been on the board of that school for the past six years. So, look, don't limit yourself by what you don't have. Enhance your journey by using the most of what is available. And trusting God to make what you have in your hand to be sufficient for what you want. 
Two, understanding that if you run alone, there's so far you can go. But understanding the power of collaboration and togetherness. I haven't found one unicorn built by one. Check. There isn't one that is built by just one individual. Most are built by teams or partnerships. Why? Two heads are better than one. So in working, learning how to work and accommodate and being humble in spirit to recognize talents and gifts in others and be open to receive from them, from what they have, to combine with what you have will permit and allow you to build bigger and better. And then don't keep saying to yourself, because I don't have this, I cannot do this. No. What I always say is, what can you do despite? Despite what you don't have, despite what you don't see. And there are many things we don't have in Nigeria. But guess what? Actually makes us more innovative and productive. When Nigerians get to international spaces, they excel so much because they've had to learn how to survive with so little that they have become creative and exceptional. Thank you. And so what we think is our disadvantage is playing out to be advantages for Nigerians who live abroad. Because they, look, I had a friend that we went to Ife together, was a medical doctor, he's, he's a medical doctor. He's in a certain specific area, trained in Ife, then did inter whatever, housemanship or whatever they do at Unilag and all of that. You know in Nigeria, as a doctor, you find unusual ways to help your patients because everything you need is not there. And the guy had had some crude solutions. So when he now moved to America and was working and all of that, he was uh, in charge of this department in this, some local rural county and all of that. And the, whether it's the mayor's daughter or somebody had a problem, that they had tried the best of all sorts of doctors to solve the problem, they had not been able to. When is your moment? The Lord will cause problem for another in order to promote you. When he got to a point that all their standard processes failed, the guy asked to speak to the parents of the child. Now, these were the most powerful people in the community and went to them and said, please, I know that this is a challenge and we've tried everything, but will you permit me to try an unconventional process that I know we, we tried and we used successfully when I was training in Nigeria? Shouldn't they run? But they were at the point where they were desperate for anything. And so, they allowed him. That's how their family's problem was solved. That's what made him become a superstar. That's what made that mayor support him to be medical director of that institution. So, can we be great as a nation? We are designed to be great. We are equipped to be great. But we, the Nigerians, have failed to let our greatness emerge. From our corruption, to our bad behavior, to the too many things. Don't let me get into that. So what we as a church can do individually, decide that you will be the difference. Decide that you will be a true child of God that will manifest what it is to be Christ-like in a nation that has so much to give but with so many problems. But understanding that the Bible already says you are more than a conqueror and that at, at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, that every problem will submit to the God in you. That no matter what the situation is, you have the capacity within you to overcome it. Sometimes it means you're resilient. Sometimes it means you suffer for a season. But if you suffer for a reason with hope in Christ, because the Bible says we hope against hope, then we can do what we will do. Look, all of the banks that are owned by individuals or groups of individuals, so to speak, don't forget they were built in Nigeria. They were started in Nigeria. And in the time that the new generation banks started in 2003, 2004, thereabout, all the guys that started it were in their 30s. It's true. Go and check. Atedo Peter's side, um, uh, Fola Adeola, 
um, Jimovia, uh, Tayo Adereoku, all the guys who started the new generation banks were all in their 30s when the bank started. There was a change of policy and of law that enabled new generation banks to be built. What was the capital? Five million naira. But five million of them. And they all got up and different people and they wanted to do things differently. What do you want to change? Which sector annoys you and irritates you? What do you see every day that you want to break the head of the people the way they do it? How do you want to do it differently? Take it up, start it. Fail at it once, fail at it twice, fail at it ten times, so what? If you want to succeed, you must learn how to fail. You must understand that failure means absolutely nothing. It's a useless word. That is an experiment in preparation. Thank you, Ma. Wow. Okay, I want to ask a question, and this is a very important question because, thankfully, you sit on the two sides of the coin. You sit in the church as a pastor and also in the marketplace. What would you say is the intersection? And I want you also to speak to the church in this regard. What do you think the church should be doing um, to empower um, working professionals and also um, people who are in business and give them thought wisdom in that regard what what are the thin lines you've observed because sometimes we swing to one side of the pendulum and say we're not really supposed to be involved in things like that are we supposed to are we not supposed to and what would be the thoughts in that regards to merge that two together there are kings and there are priests and there has to be for us to successfully rule in the market Every Christian child of God who is in the marketplace must be a priest in that space. Mm. That is the truth. Because if you don't approach the assignment with that understanding that you're a priest and a servant of God at that assignment, wow. it means that when the world challenges you with compromises, you will fall. Because it will tell you that there's no way you can succeed in it without those compromises. And out of fear, not wanting to fail in the eyes of the world, you will follow. And once you follow, your priesthood is stripped. Why? The Bible says the eyes of the Lord does not see evil. God removes himself from the space. It means then you're running alone. And you become subject to the rules of the world. And you'll be weaker at it because you are not of the world. That is the reality. Now... There's some challenges there, and the challenge is many pastors are not necessarily, do not necessarily have a full understanding of the marketplace. And therefore, sometimes between the counsel that is given and what is needed in terms of applicable wisdom, based in the word, but applicable in the market, there's a challenge. So I think as a body, if we really want to build this army, of market priests, pastors ourselves must be humble enough to say, I don't know this side. There must be development programs that bring pastors to understand some fundamentals of the market and more marketplace people who are themselves pastors. So that there is an alignment of thoughts and needs that makes it easier to support. Because you see, it's like having a number of individual players in a football team. But who harnesses their individual skills together for the team to win? The coach. So if the coach lacks the skill, it's like watching an orchestra. Different people can play different instruments. Who brings out the music? The conductor. So if we do not invest in building the coaches and the conductors, we leave the different talents disabled and weakened. This is the truth. And there are new issues that we must deal with. The new issues are, we are building a new generation of people with old age wisdom. What does that mean? The way we approach marriage and counsel for young people in church 
were causing problems. Because we're, we're in the time and the season when the emergence of the female children of God, the female sons of God, cannot be denied. Their assignment is clear. The hand of God upon their life is without doubt. God laid the example in the Deborahs and the Judges and all of the leaders that the Bible records. And when God, every promise, I have not seen a place in the Bible where the promises are gender-based. Every promise of God is for the kingdom, is for the sons of God. And the sons of God are both male and female. 50% of Nigeria's population and the world's population is women. It's absolutely impossible for the world to achieve its economic target of sufficiency without the 50% of womanhood being maximized. This is the truth. And this is not, we are a feminist. Are, no, no, no. I'm a child of God with the understanding of God. I run the rest of my life with the power of God and I'm confident that the Lord has called me to sit in every place I sit now and that I will yet sit in the future. So God is not the author of confusion. He didn't create girls with brain, with wisdom, with understanding, with passion, with drive, with ability to deliver only to then undermine them. The church needs to be careful in ensuring that we find the balance. Mm. In the days when women were okay just sitting at home and playing certain roles, the counsel of the time, based on the culture of the time and of those particular communities worked, but God is God. And God, the word of God, we, you know what we do? We force our thoughts, our opinion and our culture into the mouth of God. Mm. Because when we take the word of God and we define it in a way that just fits our own vision, we limit God. God doesn't confuse people. I'm smart, I'm brilliant, and so are many girls in this room. And I do not apologize for it. So, how do we, how do we build teams that can work? Teams of husband and wife that know how to work together for the purpose of God. Because you know what? No matter how smart, how brilliant you are, how ambitious you are, if you're married and your home isn't working, you're undermined. Whether male or female, that's another tool that the devil is using to stop the church. We're a nation of people. If 50% of your population, of your asset base, if the devil confuses you and says to you, lock them down, you're a fool. Because your business, no matter how hard you work, the other 50%, you can never achieve maximum results. So we need to work out how the home works better with a team of men and women that know how to respect, love each other, support each other, and maximize the talent in one another. And the church is the one that has the biggest role in it. Because our people believe us. They trust what we say. We, we show it by example. The pastors mirror it. And some don't. This is, let's, we're having an honest conversation. We're building a new generation. You guys cannot be like that. You have to be a team. You and your husband must be an inseparable team. The best team in the world that cannot be beaten is a team of a husband and a wife. But husband and a wife with understanding. I have been married in December. It will be 32 years since I have been married. Yes. And the most things I have done in my, I'd only been in business for about a year, a year plus when I got married. So which means in my 34 years of business, most of my business life has been as the wife of my husband. What does that mean? I'm here this morning, Saturday morning. Shouldn't I be sitting at home making breakfast? But my husband is a liberated man. Yes, he has understanding and he knows my gifts and my talent, my desires and my commitment to my assignment. And whilst I have a responsibility to ensure there's a system that makes sure that those things do not fail, I also have a responsibility to me to account to God for the call and the giftings of God in my life. So if you are blessed by my talent, it's because someone called my husband also made the sacrifice to create for me an enabling environment to run. Wow. 
Wow. Okay. Let's take two more questions. Two more questions. I think you've touched on this a little bit. Um, you are a renowned leader, a female, at that, and in a sector that wasn't popular for women. How did you navigate that? So I'll just take the two questions. Um, and the second question would be this. What is the place of the church and believers in shaping our nation, particularly in the political landscape of these times? Politics, we need to get involved. How many people are in a political world? Guess what? It doesn't matter what you think about any primary. The process of a primary that presents the candidate that you then use your voters card to vote for is only determined by members of the party. So if we're not there, we're out of it. And then we are then forced to use our voters card to choose between whatever they have decided are options. Well, we can complain all we like. There's a system. It doesn't serve us. We know that. How do we change it? Big question. If everybody in this church decides that you live in this neighborhood, and I don't know where you live, and you want to change the face of the politics in your county or your neighborhood or your local government, and you mobilize a thousand right-thinking, young, Christian-minded, God-fearing people to go and join the major parties, their ward in your area, you will control it. That is the truth. Until we become comfortable to know that we're in the middle of a battle for the land. Wow. We're in the middle of a battle for the soul of a nation. Wow. We're in the middle of fighting for the sanity, the prosperity, and the greatness of a nation. And we need to wake up. You know, there's nothing that annoys me more than comfortable Nigerians at a table, wine in hand, chicken on the table, everything around, fighting and arguing with themselves as if they're going to kill themselves over what they are not involved in making decisions about. <laughs> because they will finish all the conversation, they'll all go to their comfortable beds and go and sleep. <laughs> you will fight at the bus stop with somebody over political conversation, but you are not involved in it. Why? We have all ceded our rights. Yes, that's what we've done. We've ceded our rights to those who say they are in those political parties to decide for us whoever they want, anyhow they want it. And once they have done that, we then foolishly have to go and endorse their choices by a vote. Because you cannot vote for who you want. You can only vote for those that are presented. So if whoever you want is not on the list of those presented, too bad for you. But there is a legal official process. And we're annoyed by it, okay? It's not giving us the kind of results we want, okay? We've been at this for 62 years and we still don't have results. Or what, 62 years? Yes. We still don't have the kind of result that we want, okay? What do we need to do? Only a foolish man continues to do the same thing and expects a different result. So guys, you're young, it's your future. Hmm. Let's be honest. Let's not kid ourselves. In December, I will be 60. Which means if I, live, if I live till 80 or I live till 90, 30 more years of Nigeria, I'm sure I can manage. <laughs> I am not joking because I want to anger you. I want you to be angry enough to fight for your future. Listen to me. The country you allow to emerge is the country you will live in. You and your children. And stop thinking, oh, I'm going to emigrate to Canada. Okay, good luck to you. When you get to minus 54 and minus 60 degrees, you will remember home. It's true. So, it's okay. Some can go. And I have nothing against us having migrants all over the place. Why? It's economically viable for Nigeria. The highest income earner for Nigeria is diaspora remittances. As at now, it's literally bigger than oil money. So, in a country of 200 million people, it's a sound business model. If we even can be deliberate about it and put structures in place to help Nigerians to get into every corner of the world, work, 
They will always have a family back home they will send money to. And that money will affect our economy. So it's a good strategy. So me, I never complain. Every time you go, okay, there will be a gap. Somebody doesn't know as much. We'll train somebody else to fill up. One man's loss is another man's gain. Every person that's gone to Canada, another Nigerian has benefited in promotion. So I don't have a problem because we have enough people without job or people in the pipeline. That's not my problem. My problem is no matter where you are. Have you been to Canada? When two or three or four Nigerians are gathered even in Canada, what would be the purpose of their conversation? Can you get away from Nigeria? No. <laughs> We've got this, let's use it. Let's think differently. Your generation needs to stand up and fight for your country. Not by taking arms, but by strategically fighting with your brain. Making moves that you know we will get this result in two years, in four years, in six years, in ten years. This is the country we want. This is how. There are two election cycles in ten years. Outside of this one. Within 10 years, there'll be two more elections. So can, if you decide now, by the time I'm 30, by the time I'm 40, by the time I'm 50, this is the kind of Nigeria we want. If you guys in this room decide, and you get out and you influence others to build an army of yourselves for the right reasons, you will not have the same country. You cannot go to a country other people suffered to build. Some people paid the price. Those countries too. Go and read the history of some of those countries. America, bootlegging, all sort of corruption, criminal enterprises that were in control of everything, killing themselves like, you know, wild, wild west. Where did that come from? Was it Nigeria? No. So some people suffered to put order and to build a system. And even with that, Trump still emerged. <laughs> so that tells you it's not a one-off work. It's a continuous process. And you guys have a responsibility. Thank you. You know what? Can we all just rise, everyone? And, and now, just before you go, just before you go, one last question. I was standing here, and I'm looking at your Bible, and I can, I, I can touch it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> it's old it's if you look at it from here you can know that somebody is using this thing I, I mean I, I'm good. tell us a little bit about your fellowship your prayer life okay please all right I will pull something now okay so let me start from... Okay, you may sit now. I'll use the example that when I was appointed to the board of First Bank, my pastor called me. I serve under Pastor Taiwo Dukoya at the Fountain of Life Church. That's my pastor. And very proudly too. And he said to me, Pastor Blessing, that's what he calls me. He says, sit down. You know, if a man got this position he will be out now looking for power with which to occupy it mm. he said but I know you and I know you have nothing else but Jesus I want you to remember that no matter what you see there no matter what challenge you face that that Jesus will be enough for you mm. and you will not have to look for anything else to walk you through this assignment. I can say without any fear of contradiction that I have nothing else but Jesus. And that Jesus has been enough for me since I met him 32 plus years ago. And understanding and wisdom makes me know you cannot have a relationship with someone you don't communicate with. And the best thing that I found useful is even in the toughest of the moments 
to just go back to him. Lay at his feet. Cry to him. And hold on to him. And never let him go. So, how do I pray? I'm not even one of those pray, pray till you die person. But I pray. My mornings are my best time with God. And in not 6 a.m. There's some 6 a.m. prayers I've been doing because I'm part of a team and we're doing that. But ordinarily, when I wake up at, after 7 or something in the morning, then I spend my time walking up and down in my house just having fellowship with God. When I'm flying, I fly a lot. I live in the plane. I have found the dead time in the plane when you cannot reach me on my phone to be a useful time of fellowship. I have learned to be quiet on a flight. And I realize that I hear God the most when I'm on a plane. I hear him. I get instructions. I get a chance to run through decisions I have made or steps I am taking in order to receive guidance on what to do next. One other thing, I have learned to trust the voice of God even when I am not sure what I have heard. If what I am hearing is not against the word and is not against the law, I have permitted myself to have the courage to try it, even if I will fail at it. Why? Because I might just, I would rather fail at it and be wrong and learn a lesson than fail to respond to God and miss his instruction at all. And in doing that, you have to create for yourself a support system, a tribe of people of like mind who are your support system sisterhood and brotherhood that you know you can trust spiritually and therefore sometimes you just call one two three four and say guy i'm going through this i need you to back me i can't even pray right now i need you to just stand with me walk through with me and i'm praying and that keeps you in check and when you create those kind of tribes you also empower them how do you empower them you give them the right to knock your head when they need to you give them the right to call you and say girl girl what are you doing you can't do that you must take yourself off any pedestal and put yourself always on the ground because if you are not that sensitive and willing to allow God to be at the center of it you will miss it and trust me, success has a pride of its own that it carries and it brings. But it's the worst mistake you will ever make in your life. You know one of the best things I've learned? A CV means nothing to me. You know why? It's history. Your CV is history. It's yesterday's achievement. Been there, done that, done. What am I focused on? Tomorrow. What's new? what is yet to be done. So I can never be impressed by my own CV because I don't care about it. Every day counts, but it counts with Jesus. And in doing that, I need to make myself open to God in fellowship. Church is important. Why? Because for those periods of time, you are forced to listen to the scriptures and to the word. And to have the humility to receive from anyone, including a child, I have no pride when it comes to the word. Thank you. Can we rise and just give her a very big hand?